I lost my tiller. I left it on the launching ramp last time we went out for a sail. Where am I going to find some timber to replace it though? So where do you go looking for a piece of hewn pine to make a new tiller if you live in Queensland and hewn pine only grows in Tasmania? Well, here could be the answer. In the bedroom. There's a, a lot of hewn pine there. And I think it's been over-engineered. It sits up against the wall, so you can't see any of that. So I'm quite sure that um, my wife's not going to miss a piece. What are you doing, darling? Oh, I'm just doing a bit of work on the bed head. Fantastic. I've been waiting for you so long to restore the bed. Yep, no, it's going to be better than ever. Now I've had my eye on this bed head for a long time. Because I always thought it was over engineered. When they were flooding Lake Pedder, there was a lot of hewn pine that was getting drowned. And So the forestry was recovering it. The company called Tasmanian Board Mills had acquired it all. And a lot of it was wasted. I remember being offered two racks of timber at $250 each. Probably worth $25,000 each now. So they set up a They set up a furniture workshop. They brought in, brought in a uh, furniture designer from Scandinavia and he did design some really beautiful furniture. But the problem is the execution was really poor. So the quality of these beds was really bad. Anyway. There we go, perfect. Oh, it's coming along quite well. Yes. Good. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I thought it was going to be a bigger job, but it's actually. It's actually not too big a job at all. You know what it's like when you take something apart and then you put it back together and you've got a, a part left over and you can't work out where it came from. But it doesn't seem to make any difference. Well, I hope not. I'll just get this bit of rubbish and I'll put it out in the workshop. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like I may have got away with that. I guess it'll be pinned on next time we have guests where it holds all together. So, uh, so this is the, the situation that we have. Um, recently we went out in Moonlight and uh, when we were launching the boat um, we left the tiller behind on the boat ramp and, and it's gone. So. Um, the tiller was made out of hewn pine, as the rest of the boat is, which is a, a rare and uh, difficult to get species of timber these days, especially when you live in Queensland and hewn pine only grows in Tasmania. 
So the uh, remaining stocks, uh, I'm not sure. I think you can still get a bit from time to time. But one of the challenges is you've got a 40 year old boat, you, want, you don't want to put a brand new piece of timber in it. So I needed some timber that was 40 years old. So it just happens that uh, when we were first engaged uh, 40 something years ago, before Moonlight was built, Denise and I bought a hue and pine bed. And I've always thought it was a bit over engineered, but uh, never got around to do anything about it. And uh, I've had my eye on bits and pieces, thinking I could make something much nicer. So I managed to salvage this piece of um, hue and pine, just um, inch and a quarter, and perfect. And it's got that um, aged colour, because even when I sawed it, uh, even when I took the saw to it, I noticed that the shavings are a, sort of a, a deep um, auburn colour, whereas fresh hue and pine is, is close enough to cream or white. So this will blend in really nicely with Moonlight and no one will ever know the story behind it unless you tell someone. I managed to find some photos of the original tiller and what I'm doing now is I've made a, uh, a template, I'm making a template out of half inch plywood so that I can get all, all the angles right and thinking back to the days when John Philp was mentoring me and his Old saying, you probably heard me say it before, make it eye sweet. So there's no measurement for eye sweet. So let's see what we can come up with. Some people think I'm crazy and they're probably right. If they saw me sitting here, that would just confirm their suspicions. But the best way to get a feel for it is here. Now that's a bit higher than it was uh, previously. I'll just drop that down. Be able to move forward and the main thing is managing the jib sheet and then of course uh, starting the motor manage the jib sheet and apart from that if you want to do anything any further forward you're going to have to lash this off so that's pretty good you want it to clear clear your knee and just, yeah, just dropping it down a little bit because I think it's a, a little too high. It's starting to feel right. Length is about right. Just want to create that old familiar feel. It was, it was just very comfortable how it was. But I think that's pretty good. Just, not even just tighten that on there a bit. Lose that, we take it off, and so there's a fair bit of trimming now to, to get that template just right. And when, when the template's perfect, then the next thing will be to transpose this onto the piece of hue and pine that I salvaged earlier. We're making good progress. I'm happy that that's set up pretty well there now, and I'll put an extra clamp on it so that it doesn't. Definitely don't want that moving or falling off. So we'll just uh, remove that and take it over to the workbench. Start work on refining the template. How long can we walk the line between the sea and sand? How long can we bide our time for dreams we never planned? For dreams we never planned? When the sky said the winter time is coming on And you cry to see a shadow wave It's growing long Cross along another song Tuesday night, it's 3 a.m. I ought to be asleep. If only I could tell you all about the dreams I keep. Or about the dreams I keep. I wake up every morning and I'm 
wasted all the day I turn it all around if I could only hear you say that you were here to stay when the sky said the winter time is coming on and you cry to see a shadow bay is growing long across the line another song City glow. I still recall the nights when I could hear you breathing. I got you breathing low. But it's too late to turn around, too cold to go outside. I wonder if I saw this love as anything inside. Another place to hide. Going. So I've got a bit of a compound curve going on here. It's nothing too aggressive. Yeah. Sort of tapering down to where the, the grip is fairly parallel. The truth is we lost the filler and um, it's making a new one. Yeah, making a new one. And, I needed a piece of 40 year old hill and pine. We just happened to have a spare bit on the bed. <laughs> so I'm just paring this down now to get that taper right. And uh, it's surprising, you just take a little bit off and it starts, it starts to slip in, it's still sitting back in there about, about an inch or so. But I know from past experience, I don't need to take too much off. But it looks like I've got the right angles there. Just a little bit of a wobble. Take a bit more off here. Yeah, I want to get this near enough to perfect. It's still a bit, a bit much just here. Joystick take it off here, I can take it off here. And then To get that line right, it needs to come off here. Actually, 
Again, we'll put the bottom pin in first. The top pin, goes down. Whack the back of the head on the brackets. Lovely. Working very sort of tight circumstances here. Yeah. How's it? So it fits pretty good. There's no wobble up and down. So we deal with the sideways you know, by creating a wedge to fit the cavity inside the, the rudder perfectly to prevent any wobble sideways. And just step back and have a look at that line. What do you think? On the bright side Never have to hide again Together never has to end and will be Not an issue here, there's, there's plenty of strength in this but to my eye that's showing a bit, bit much of a mound here I'd prefer to see that taken down a bit but probably I'm not handed so it's hard to I don't know, I think you're probably around about this area here I'll put a fairing rod on there from here to here on the batten and just bend it and I'll cut that back down to a nice curve, so we create that compound curve. Still got a little bit of a bump here, which I prefer not to have. So after I'd fi finished building Moonlight, I decided that I wanted to build things with straight lines, so I started building furniture for a while. And I did some nice stuff. Um, but really my heart wasn't in it. I went on from there to building houses. We built a mud brick house and in later years we built quite a lot of houses. But uh, really I, I think I missed something, you know. I lost, I lost something on the way and I'm really enjoying re-engaging with this old dinghy and, uh, and really feeling my passion wooden boats is uh, is growing um, and uh, one of the really exciting parts of it, about this is that I've got some young people who are also interested in boats they've not had boating backgrounds and um, got a couple of guys coming along tomorrow to help me to do some repairs uh, to our 40 year old fiberglass trailer sailor and uh, and that's that's a lot of fun uh, <clears throat> they've got heaps of youthful energy I'll put that to good use and I'll pick up some skills along the way as well and uh, we're really looking forward to it. So nearly there now. There's really nothing that's going to work better than actually sitting in the boat and getting a feel for it. So sitting in there quite nicely. I think it looks pretty good. When I make when I make the piece out of the original human pine, this 40 year old piece of uh, human pine that uh, it just turned up in my workshop somehow, um, I think I'll make it a little bit longer and uh, just see how that goes and then I might trim it back because I don't actually have a pattern. Good thing is I've got a pattern now. And um, yeah, I'm just sort of thinking maybe it could be just a tiny bit longer. You don't want it too long because you've got to move forward. You don't want it too short because you need to be able to come forward here and manage the jib shirts. So first of all I'm going to work out where's the best piece out of this to, to take from. Um, once upon a time I would have been doing everything I possibly could to avoid some knots and edges, but it's um, a different world that we live in now and I'm quite happy to include a few knots in the finished item. So that seems to have worked around most of the issues and it will leave a bit of structure. It'll leave a, a, a bit of feature in the timber. 
because it's something that you, you spend a lot of time attached to the tiller so it's nothing like a nice piece of timber with some character in it Oh, that sweet smell of hewn pine. Now, the first time I smelt that, my dad took me over to the bandsaw in his workshop, grabbed some sawdust out of the bottom of the bandsaw and said, here son, smell this. And uh, then he got some, um, then he got some king billy pine sawdust. And he said, "Now smell this one." And then he got some celery top pine and said, "Smell that one," which it doesn't have much of a smell at all. But so I guess that's why I've got woodworking in my system. Beautiful. We see the <coughs> the growth rings on that. See how fine they are. So this is a probably a. Could be a 2,000 year old piece of hewn pine. Just in that distance across there, I'll count the growth rings. So there's 10 growth rings just across that distance there. So we're talking 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So there's 60 years of growth just across that. Now I'll sand the end off just to get some kind of an idea about what the size of the tree is that it came out of. I dare say it wasn't a small tree. So the, gro the, the growth rings are running across here fairly flat. So you know this, this could have been a tree this far through so I'll give you an idea. 60 years just across that section there. I'm going to scribe a line down here because this is a bit thicker than it needs to be, not by much. But actually, I did the wrong side, I'm going to do the other side because I can actually get rid of some of those knots there. As you see, there's not as many on that side. I'm going to grab the rotary hoe, as John used to call it. Just trim that down a bit. Peter Planer, I think it's as old as the boat. Could even, no, maybe not. Uh, yeah, actually, I think it would be. I think that was one of the things I bought. I think they still make the same model today. It says a lot for Makita. So what an amazing wife I have. She's so grateful for me repairing a bed this morning that she brought me chocolate chip cookies. Thank you, dear. My pleasure. I started out my working life working in the Forestry Commission in Tasmania. So as a 17 year old they used to send us to the forest flung places like Strawn and Smithton and Scottsdale. So I had a ball for a year or two. <clears throat> and uh, of course uh, hue and pine grows down on the west coast of Tasmania. And uh, I got to see you and pine growing in its natural environment. Surprised at how fast it does grow from the seeding. I've seen two year old specimens this high growing in nothing but quartz gravel. Um, but uh, in most cases, it doesn't grow that fast, it grows very, very slowly. 
um, maybe it slows down as it matures. Um, <clears throat> but uh, while I was down there, this is back in the 70s, there was a fire uh, broke out on the Gordon River and they had volunteer firefighting crews that uh, came down to fight that fire. And um, there was a guy by the name of Reg Morrison. Now, the Morrison family is very famous uh, in Hue and Pine circles. Um, they go right back to the old pining days. In fact, I think Reg was one of the last of the original piners that used to go up the river and fall trees into the river and float them down. They had Morrison's sawmill, which I believe now is a heritage listed site. Uh, the tourists go down there and they're literally, I don't know what they're paying for it these days, but these shavings, probably what I've got in my hand there, they sell in a bag. Aromatic resins in the hue and pine are really good to place in a little bag and put in your cupboard and they'll stop um, silverfish and cockroaches and things like that if you like mothballs. But uh, yeah, it really, really is quite a unique timber and uh, I don't think there's anything like it. Now having said that, I met a man, his name is Mark Blackwell. And Mark, I hope you see this. Um, Mark was running a, a mission um, in New Guinea, in the, in the central highlands of New Guinea. And Mark um, told me that while he was there, they ran a sawmill, um, the, uh, the, and the local people used to work in the sawmill and they'd throw a few sweet potatoes in a fire to keep them going because they were mostly malnourished and didn't have much energy. So he was running this uh, sawmill, which was a mission, and he said he is convinced that they had hue and pine logs coming through that mill. So if it wasn't hewn, it would have been something closely related because it's a very unique and distinctive smell. I'd like to go down. He was taking this group of volunteer firefighters down to the Gordon River and um, he took me in his boat, the J. Lee M, which was the first Hue and Pine boat that he built as a tourist boat. Um, so later on he built the, uh, the Denison Star and I think there was another one called the Gordon Explorer or something like that. And now it's a very popular tourist destination, or at least it was before COVID hit. Um, and hopefully we'll be again. But uh, yeah, I, I have um, very fond memories of that trip. It takes uh, quite a while, I can't remember, but maybe you know, three or four hours even um, to get down there along Macquarie Harbour and uh, into the Gordon River where we offloaded our cargo of volunteers and headed back. So my job was, uh, making, was uh, making tea and coffee and sitting up there at the helm watching Reg and just listening to him chat about um, the old days. When I built Moonlight, Hue and Pine by that stage, it wasn't um, impossible to get, but it was in short supply, especially quarter sawn, clear planking. And um, but I was able to um, to find what we needed, and I remember it cost two hundred and fifty dollars um, for the entire batch of timber, the entire pack of timber to build Moonlight. Uh, so I went down with a mate of mine to the railway station and he had a little truck and we went down to the railway station, picked it up and they loaded it on the back of the truck with a forklift, we tied it on, put a couple of bearers under it and headed off and then we went round the first bend and, and as we went round the corner into Lindsay Street, took off quickly into moving traffic, the entire pack of timber just slipped straight off the back of the truck and landed slap in the middle of the road. So we had to find a way of un doing the wires on it and uh, load it all back on hand in the middle of peak hour traffic and then away we went again. That really strong light coming from behind there you can see 
down the sides when you're actually planting it down in the final stages. And I'll be honest with you, I'm going to cheat a bit now because uh, as the human pine that I'm using is about 40 years old uh, and it's got a bit of feature in it, so the grain's a bit cranky and it's wanting to tear out. So I'm going to use the belt sander. I had this timber flooring business and, uh, and a fellow will call him Brian just to protect the innocent. Actually his name really was Brian. Um, anyway, so Brian had taken a belt sander home to his workshop and he was making some little timber components. While he was doing it he slipped and his thumb went straight down the back of the sander. Ouch. And so I get this phone call and uh, Brian says look I think you should come into the hospital. He, uh, he said I'm sitting up in the car and I've got a belt sander stuck on the end of my thumb. Um, so I jumped in the car, raced around to the hospital, and there's Brian, sure enough, sitting up there with a big smile on his face, laughing and joking with the nurses, and he's got this belt sander, exactly the same as this one, stuck on the end of his thumb. And the local staff, uh, the medical staff, said, look, uh, we've taken every bit off that we can find, so they've completely taken off all the housings and so on, but we can't get it apart. Can you help us get it apart because we need to get his thumb out? And um, so I said to them, look, have you got a screwdriver? And I reckon we can do something. So they raced around the place and they found they found a, uh, a little um, straight-bladed screwdriver and they came up and it was like a screwdriver that you get out of a children's toy kit, honestly. It was covered in rust and I thought this is not really um, the best hygienic process. I was expecting something you know, to have come from the, from the surgery. And... Um, Anyway, so I took the screwdriver and I uh, I managed to sort of wedge it down the back here and just, just lift the plastic up like that. And as I did, Brian's thumb popped out and with that all the colour drained out of his face and he almost passed out from the pain. And it wasn't such a joke anymore. It actually took quite a long time for his thumb to recover. It was um, severely... Uh, fractured and, um, and lacerated so it had to all be put back together but uh, here we go so Brian now has uh, a working thumb and I had to replace my belt sander well on the subject of microsurgery with the magic of cinematography I've been able to fit that tapered wedge there so that it fits perfectly So there it is, one new tiller. We're dancing all around I woke up With a sunrise on the sea It's such a priceless gift to me The salty breeze And the waves The slow pace The salty breeze And the waves I'm out of our place Yeah, so it's 
been a pretty big day and I've got that tiller finished. I'm a bit weary after all that, so I'm not gonna lie down and have a bit of rest. Think about the next project. Salty breeze in my home.